Welcome everyone to this uh, exciting webinar hosted by the World Obesity Federation, which is entitled How Are Young People Catalyzing Action on Childhood Obesity During COVID-19? Uh, my name is uh, Marie Hauerslev and I'm the chair of NCD Child. I am from Denmark and I also work as a doctor in a, in a pediatrics department. Welcome so much to this webinar. Uh, I won't say much because we have a very exciting uh, agenda and, and uh, very impressive speakers ahead. But, uh, but just to let you know that the background for this webinar is that although children are not as directly impacted by COVID-19 as, as adults, their lives have been changed in, immensely in, in many, many ways uh, during this pandemic. And that's what we, we aim to, to speak more about uh, at this upcoming discussion. Uh, in NCD Child, we have had uh, two major projects during uh, the pandemic. One was in the very beginning where we had a project called Youth COVID Chats, where we highlighted uh, young people from all over the world, their thoughts on uh, the linkages between NCDs, so non-communicable diseases in general, and, and risk factors for NCDs and how those have been uh, affected for, for children and, and young people and what they were experiencing themselves, whether they were advocates uh, for specific NCD-related issues or living with uh, NCDs themselves. And uh, there we, we really saw uh, some major points around uh, physical activity being limited, uh, major changes in the diets and access to healthy foods, and also uh, very devastating stories around the effect on, on mental health that lockdown and, and COVID-19 itself had. Another thing that we did was uh, we were able to have a, a meeting with the Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros, uh, which was also broadcasted uh, online. And here we, um, we got the chance through, through a youth panel as well to highlight how young people's health have, have been affected during the pandemic um, through the, the secondary and tertiary um, measures um, taken to, to limit the, the infection. Um, and also we got the chance to speak to, to, to people in the WHO and the Director General himself around uh, the importance of engaging young people in a meaningful way as a response to this um, the pandemic as well. Uh, so that's a little bit about me and what I've been doing and, and what NCD Child has been doing through this, um, throughout this year. Um, and now into to this webinar, uh, which we've just started, a, a few housekeeping comments. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and will be um, available to you uh, afterwards. So uh, you'll be able to, to rewatch if you're interested in that or to share the link uh, with, with other people or colleagues that might be interested. If you have questions, uh, you can ask them in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to, to ask them uh, by the end of the webinar. And uh, the recording slides and, and the feedback form and a certificate for, for attendance will also be circulated uh, post this webinar. Next slide, please. And here is uh, what we have for you today. Uh, so just this brief welcome from me as the beginning and then afterwards we'll hear a, a little bit about childhood obesity in the context of COVID. And then we'll hear uh, about addressing childhood obesity and, and what works. And then we'll have a, a really exciting youth panel and then a brief uh, wrap up. And for the youth panel, you'll have the chance to ask questions. And uh, yeah, as I said, we'll do our best to, to try to cover as much ground as possible through that. Thank you. And uh, yeah, here it's really just a slide for you to see the faces of the speakers. I'll present them more uh, detailed when they're about to speak so that uh, I'm sure that you remember them. And yeah, this is the youth panel that we have for you. Okay, and I think we'll just move on to our first speaker who is uh, Claudia selen -Betz. She is the policy and education coordinator from the World Obesity Federation and a core team member of, of Young Leaders for health. Uh, she has a great expertise uh, working with childhood obesity and she's a youth advocate and a young, young global health uh, professional. Claudia, please the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie, for the kind introduction. 
and to all my colleagues at World Obesity for giving me this opportunity to speak today. My presentation will address childhood obesity in the context of COVID-19. When the webinar series commenced, we had only 1 million cases of COVID-19. Now, on 30th of October, we have surpassed 45 million case infections globally, with the highest prevalence in the US, Brazil and India. We have a rapid acceleration of the virus across the world, with second waves being reported, reported across Europe and new lockdowns being imposed in countries including France. We must note that the reported numbers are just a subset of the infections, and especially amongst kids who are commonly asymptomatic. The response to this should be really reflect on the power of collective working, breaking down the barriers between different groups of people, and that's where, and bringing that, and that's where youth come into play to really bring solutions to the table. I'd like to start off by giving um, a quick snapshot of childhood obesity prevalence globally. A year ago at World Obesity, we published the Childhood Obesity Atlas, a report revealing astonishing figures and evidence that globally, the number of children that are living with overweight or obesity is rising rapidly. From an estimated 158 million in 2020 to 254 million in 2030, the Atlas compiled country reports and shows the biggest increase in prevalence in emerging economies, including Africa, the Middle East, and the Pacific Islands. Highlighting the real, the real need to address malnutrition in all its forms and not just undernutrition. Although international targets have been developed in response to this, to halt the rise of childhood obesity, most countries have less than a 10% chance of, of meeting these targets and actions to ensure that they are reached is actually now further threatened by COVID-19. Our webinar in April looked more closely at the clinical implications of COVID-19 on youth, including the impact of COVID-19 on treatment services and the transition to telehealth as a means of delivering care. I'd like to take this opportunity to dispel some common myths. Number one, children actually do infest with manifest, manifest with severe complications as a result of COVID-19. Studies have shown that although they are less likely to develop fever, cough, um, and they, that they are typically presenting as asymptomatic, there have been cases and emergence of a rare form of disease called Kawasaki disease. And this is commonly um, a condition that primarily affects children that um, really causes inflammation in the, the blood vessels. Moreover, we have seen that actually obesity is significantly associated with mechanical ventilation in children's two, children two years or older. The cause for concern is more so the indirect con consequences of the pandemic on this, of this, on this age group. Over the past nine months, access to breastfeeding support for mothers and school feeding programs for children has been significantly reduced. Just this week in the UK, pressure has been mounting on the government to reverse its decision to not to provide free school meals over the half term. It is often the only hot meal a child will get. And in the absence of it, individuals may be forced to really to make unhealthier food choices and that are often the more affordable ones. So these spikes in retail, you know, spikes in retail prices combined with reduced incomes are already changing consumption patterns and school closures are likely to actually ex exacerbate these inequities and hence um, income in year to come for children too. It is particularly worrisome that schools are a crucial environment um, a crucial environment for obesity prevention, given their ability to reach 100%, almost 100% of children independent of their socioeconomic status. We must not forget that junk food marketing, undermining healthy eating messages, are more accessible than ever as we spend more time looking at our screens. And the burden of mental health on future generations to come, and that can itself lead to hedonic eating patterns, are consequently being and consequently a worry. Before I wrap up, I just want to um, really just allude to this diagram that were published by our colleagues at UNICEF as part of the World of the Children's Report last year. And it really brings to life some of the key points that I was alluding to and highlights where action can be taken in the food system to really increase the supply and demand of um, for nutritious foods for children and young people. I'd like to end with a call to action for youth voices to be heard in both the response to COVID-19 and mitigation efforts for infectious disease and NCDs, 
including childhood obesity. They represent the largest proportion of the population, are perhaps the most innovative and motivated individuals and are the future generation of leaders. We must therefore provide a platform for them to speak and I'm really glad that we are able to do so today. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. That, that gives us a, a very great uh, foundation for the, um, for the upcoming discussion. Uh, so I, I congratulate you on that. And uh, now we'll move on to uh, Louise uh, Tully, who is a SPEAR PhD candidate from the, at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. She's also a registered nutritionist and she has experience in uh, infant nutrition and child and adolescent weight management. Louise, please take the floor. Thank you, Marie. Hi, everyone. So um, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for having me. So last December, um, I met a fantastic international team while representing the European Association for the Study of Obesity um, at the Salzburg Global Seminar. And since then, thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, our team have been working on a project together, uh, part of which includes a policy brief. So our policy brief is aimed at outlining actionable interventions from the WHO Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity. So we want to shine a spotlight on three interventions that we feel show how much room there is for action right now in promoting child health and managing um, obesity rates. So I guess we're doing so while also acknowledging uh, that these belong to a much wider set of recommendations that are intended to be implemented together in order to address the complex systems that com contribute to poor child health um, and poor health. So uh, next slide, please. So the first of these actions relates to uh, the marketing of food and drink to children. So the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child outlines the right of every child to a healthy environment. And the WHO have consistently outlined that marketing of uh, food and drink that's high in fat, salt and sugar and poor in nutrient uh, content is a key environmental driver of unhealthy weight gain. And specifically the marketing of these foods that is directly targeted to children. So this is especially pertinent with regards to digital marketing, which is important now more than ever as children are spending so much time online. Um, and as we know, there's significantly less or no regulation of marketing online compared to what might exist for traditional media. So there is evidence that this type of marketing does influence dietary intake and modeling, st modeling studies have shown how restricting marketing to children could be both an effective and cost effective intervention for reducing obesity. So we're calling firstly for the implementation of the WHO recommendations on marketing of food and beverages to children. Next slide, please. So the second intervention, which have, has already been implemented in some regions, is the introduction of a tax on the sale of sugar sweetened beverages. So early in evaluations of these kind of taxes suggest that they do influence intake. And as well as that, they can also incentivize your formulation by industry, whereby companies reduce the sugar content of products to avoid amending costs. There's some evidence that it's a cost effective intervention and also that it won't disproportionately affect the most vulnerable, which is, of course, a key consideration of any public health intervention. Um, as well as that, there's suggestions um, with some evidence that ring fed ring fencing the revenue from sugar tax back to the healthcare budget can actually improve public buy-in for such taxes. Next slide, please. And so finally, we want to highlight as well the role of school and early childhood education settings. Uh, so they have a dual role in both supporting children and families and providing nutritious food, drinks and healthy environments on campus. So there's multiple intervention opportunities within schools and school settings. And the evidence supports the impact of things like implementing nutrition standards for school meals, restricting sale and marketing of unhealthy foods in and around schools, uh, implementing quality physical activity education, facilitating safe active transport. And of course, as Claudia mentioned, the really topical one at the minute is provision of meals to vulnerable children during school closures and periods of lockdown. So in outlining these actions, we want to acknowledge also, of course, that there are biological and genetic underpinnings associated with obesity, uh, not just the environmental ones, um, and also emphasize that malnutrition in all its forms leads to poor health. So in the context of COVID-19, it's vital that we can consider how, um, how we can achieve a healthy weight and healthy nutrition for all, as our lives have been so impacted by it. 
and the knock-on effect seems more and more likely. So we detail these three actions in our policy brief, which will be available very shortly and which we can distribute after the webinar. Um, and that's it from me. So thanks to my team also on this uh, policy brief, Alex, Rachel, Athar, Sarah and Steve. And I'm really looking forward to hearing now from the youth panel on their kind of pragmatic views on, on these interventions. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Uh, that, that was great and uh, certainly something that I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about from the youth uh, with, with specific examples. So that also gives us a very good um, foundation for, for what's coming ahead. Um, we will uh, go straight into the youth panel now and the first person we'll hear from is, is Faith Newsom. She is an aspiring obesity researcher undertaking a PhD at the University of Florida. And she's also a patient advocate living with obesity. And at 16, she underwent a gastric bypass surgery. And then shortly after, she, she undertook the effort to, to found a, a nonprofit called Oceans, which supports and advocates um, for teens with obesity. Please, uh, Faith, share your thoughts with us. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that um, introduction. So I'll just go a little bit more into my story and what I do. Um, so that it was mentioned that I am not only an advocate, but I am a patient myself. So during my entire childhood, adolescence, I experienced obesity. Um, my mom would bring things up at doctor's appointments and there wasn't really a lot of dissemination of real evidence-based information to us. So we did the best we could with internet resources and things like that. And then when I was a teenager at Duke um, in Durham, North Carolina, I started the process to undergo bariatric surgery. So I had ruin Y gastric bypass when I was 16. After that, that kind of lit a fire that I was really passionate about access to care for teens and children and not only care, but good evidence-based non-stigmatizing care. So I started Oceans, which is the support and advocacy group for adolescents with obesity. And we offer things like support groups and policy-based advocacy projects um, and things like that. So that kind of supplements the research work that I do. I kind of decided to do it all and do the advocacy and the research, um, but I'm really passionate about teenagers in specific um, and making sure that they have access to all the relevant treatment options and making sure that these recommendations that we hear about actually make it and are um, achievable and attainable for children and teens. Thank you, Faith. Um, what, an, what an impressive journey and, and story you have. Uh, we, need, we need more people like you for sure to, to, to join us uh, on this, uh, on this great mission that we're on together. It is, it is really inspiring. And, um, and with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to one of our other young people. Uh, she is also a very impressive young woman. She's the youth, uh, well, her name is Tasha Makayakora. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I'm sorry, Tasha. And she is a youth board member um, and the co-chair of uh, Fight Back 2030. Uh, she is in, very interested in how the food system is designed and she uh, aims to reform the food system so that it is healthier and better for children and young people. Tasha, please share your take on this issue with us. Hey, oh, yeah, fantastic. You pronounced my name perfectly. So no worries about that. So yeah. Hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is Tasha McIkora and I am a healthy food activist and a youth board co-chair member at Bite Back 2030. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar with the organisation, essentially we exist for a healthier generation who want to know the truth about the food system, how it's designed and how we can redesign it to put young people's health first and build a really powerful alliance with businesses, policymakers, schools, parents, parents and any other shareholder we think will help us to make that redesign a reality. Now I've only got five minutes to talk so I just really wanted to cover three important points. Um, I want to talk about the importance of youth advocacy to help turn research and policy action when it comes to solving our obesity epidemic but also talk about how COVID-19 has given us the opportunity for us to make at create 
change within the food system because it, it has exposed a lot of inequalities within our society. And I think it's really giving us, given us the opportunity to reflect on the system and how we can improve it and make sure that it is fair for everybody. And finally, I'll quickly talk about the challenges that I have faced in this activism space when it comes to uh, conflicting um, ideas and thoughts and interests, interests when it comes to working with businesses. Um, so yeah, the first thing that I really wanted to talk about is that I think a lot of us recognize that we are all up against a food um, against a flood of unhealthy food pouring out from our high streets, our supermarket, sh supermarket shelves, school canteens. And as a result, we now have 3.3 million children who are overweight and the UK has the worst childhood obesity rates in, in Western Europe. So I think any obesity strategy that aims to solve this epidemic, it needs to have the voice of young people reflected in the action plan. A lot of the time we have, you know, young people are excluded from these conversations. So essentially you have a whole bunch of adults who are talking and making decisions about young people and yet there is not a single young person involved in this decision making process and so I think it's really important that any child obesity action plan it should be child initiated initiated and also child directed and that's why I'm really happy that I'm I'm really proud that I'm working with Bite Back because we're an organization that exists for young people, but we're also ran by young people. So from the board of trustees to the youth board and to our youth leaders at every stage of this so-called hierarchy, um, we have a young person there representing the views of their peers. So I really do emphasize the importance of making sure that young people are are introduced in these conversations that we're sat at these tables and really thinking about the unique experience of young people when it comes to experiencing our food environment and making sure that that is reflected in any obesity plan. And then moving on, um, talking about the silver lining in this COVID pandemic. The one thing that you know we can take from um, the chaos that's been going on is that COVID has really exposed a lot of social inequalities within our society. So that's looking from racial tensions to health disparities. It's really given us the opportunity to act upon these findings and make things right. Um, so the Public Health England scientists found that the risk of hospital admissions for COVID-19 increased substantially with people's weight. And I think also also, alongside Johnson, uh, Boris Johnson's COVID-19 experience, that really did play a big role in his government um, strategy. Uh, so aimed at childhood obesity. And so his plans to, you know, ban uh, junk food advertising before 9 p.m., place restrictions on price promotions for foods that are high in fat, salt and sugar, you know, having a, a review looking at the traffic light labeling, all of that came out of, the, out of his experience of COVID-19. And I really don't think that any obesity strategy that was going to come out in 2020, it wouldn't have been substantial or solid enough without that personal experience that Boris experienced, but even just, this this um this revelation of how much your health can have an impact on how you experience various um diseases and finally i wanted to talk about the challenges of uh, commercial interest when it comes to businesses um so one of the things i've really taken out of a bite back is that it's really given me the opportunity to engage in conversations with businesses companies within the food industry and i think those conversations uh, we discuss when we're, when we're looking at you know the role that the companies have played in obesity in the obesity epidemic, where we're looking at, at who's responsible for what we have created. It's very clear to me that they these companies their main incentive is profit, which is rightly so. You know, at the end of the day, they are companies who have an who have an interest in increasing their revenue. So profit is what determines their business model. So I think one thing that I've really taken out of loads of conversations that I've had is it's about asking myself, and I urge you guys to ask yourself as well, but really think about how can we identify common goals when it comes to protecting society's health, not even just young people's health. Let's talk about how, what is it that we have in common? Because at the end of the day, these companies are looking for to increase their profit and we're the ones you know regular regular people like us we're the ones that are contributing to their profit so at some point they do we do have to meet in the middle so i really want us to really think about what is it that we can do that can build build a bridge between the two gaps how can we work together to make sure that you know we're satisfying the needs of these companies but we're also putting our health at the forefront of the food industry's operations. But yeah, other than that, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak um, at this panel. And yeah, I've been more than happy. I, I look forward to the conversations that we're going to be having this evening. Thank you so much, Tasha. I can't believe how much ground you covered within five minutes. It's, it's very impressive. And uh, 
uh, and some some very interesting interesting perspectives. Um, I really liked how you how you spoke uh, to the inequalities that have been exposed, and also your experiences um, with the companies that have commercial interests that are sometimes or often put above the the interests of of public health. So thank you for that. Uh, I know our next speaker also has some um, takes on that, and that is uh, Leslie Samara Vecha who is a nutritionist with a master's degree in global health and development from UCL in London. Uh, but currently she works at the National Inst Institute of Public Health in Mexico, where she has a focus on health policy development, advocacy, monitoring and evaluation. Um, and uh, I believe she, Leslie will also give us some insights uh, among um, uh, childhood obesity in Mexico also being on the rise uh, within poorer and indigenous communities. So Leslie, please. Thank you so much, Marie. I'm very glad to be here. And I would like to put you in the context of Mexico and talk about like some experiences that we had. Well, we, we have an alar alarming epidemiological situation because of the high rates of obesity and non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular diseases, which are in fact the main causes of mortality in my country. And Mexico is one of the highest of the countries with the highest prevalence of childhood obesity in the world, where 36% of ch children and 38% of adolescents live with obesity or overweight. In addition to that, Mexico has low uh, breastfeeding rates. And as you know, the first thousand days of life are crucial and critical um, to reduce the risk of obesity. And one of the main drivers that we saw with this obesity and diabetes uh, epidemic is the high consumption of ultra processed foods. The Mexican diet has shifted from mainly fresh and unprocessed food to ultra processed products, which are high in sugar, salt and sodium. And um, actually Mexico is one of the countries with the highest consumption and sales of ultra processed foods and sugar sweetened beverages. And the problem is very serious because 40% of the daily diet of children and adolescents is based on ultra processed products. And as Claudia mentioned, some of the strategies that the food and beverage industry use to promote um, the sales of ultra processed foods are aggressive marketing of unhealthy food and beverages that influence dietary preference and consumption, especially among uh, children, but also the deceitful front of pack food labeling. And Mexico has done enormous efforts to implement cost-effective public policies in order to protect uh, the health, such as the tax on sugar-sweetened beverages and the recent modification of the front of pack warning labeling. However, the main barriers during the process of implementation of these policies are the industry interference. And worldwide, these industry interference are documented, but it is very important that we are aware that those are not static, that they change, evolve, and adapt to the opportunities. For example, the industry has found ways to use COVID-19 to their favor. What we have observed in Mexico is that uh, COVID washing, that it's a phenomenon where the food industry and the sugar sweetened beverage companies pretend to clean their reputation to, through good deeds, like the donation of ultra processed food. But this is not philanthropy. They are promoting their, their products. And another observation is that food and beverage industries uh, have taken advantage the opportunity to capitalize the crisis where COVID-19 has become a new marketing strategy with the promotion of home delivery and drive through services and have dominated unhealthy food and beverage advertising. 
And at the same time, children continue to be exposed to per pervasive, in, uh, um, pervasive unhealthy food and beverages, marketing, including advertising and promotion across multiple platforms, including broadcast, print, digital, and uh, even more aggressive in social media. Additionally, uh, we saw that a breast milk substitute company in alliance with a Mexican multinational beverage and retail company launched a campaign to invite people to make monetary donations so that these companies could donate uh, cans of breast milk substitutes. And this, of course, that implies a violation of the international code of marketing of breast milk substitutes. And last but not least, uh, we also saw that food industry has used COVID-19 as an excuse to delay the warning labeling uh, implementation. And they, they were arguing that because of the economic repercussions in combination with the high cost in changing their packaging, it will result in risk uh, for their profitability. But ironically, a big food corporation changed their packaging during COVID-19 to demonstrate their solidarity to the Mexican families. So I just want to thank you for this forum because uh, they, they are so important. So we can learn from, from, from each other and from the new strategies of the food industry that, that they ideate to block public policies that compromise their commercial interest. But also it's important that we share like practices to overcome their efforts to influence public health. Thank you so much, Leslie. I really, uh, I really enjoyed the term COVID washing and I think it really sort of nails it down what, what some of these industries are doing. And it is just, um, so incredibly sad to see how children's and young people's lives are being affected in, in this way. And um, we discussed this during our planning of this webinar, how it is, of course, the responsibility of the companies, but also us, the civil society and the government to, to take uh, action to put uh, public health first. So uh, thanks again for that. Another uh, expert on childhood obesity is our next speaker, that is uh, Pierre Cook Jr who is the One Young World Ambassador, and he's also the Prime Minister of the Barbados National Youth Parliament. And then on top of that, he is the um, technical advisor to the Healthy Caribbean Coalition. And he's doing all of this whilst he's studying a law degree. So that is, that is truly a, a busy man that we will hear from now. Um, he will speak also um, to the Caribbean uh, context and uh, childhood obesity during this special time. Pierre, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Marie. And indeed, I am presenting from the Law Library on campus. Um, I'm really, really happy to be a part of this conversation because it's always been important to me to see young persons engage in a meaningful way to have these discussions about what is needed to protect the rights of children, protect the rights of young people, and ensure that we have better access to health services. Now, uh, earlier this year in February, I attended a uh, summit in Sharjah, and we were talking about bridging the gap when it spoke to public health and uncommunicable diseases. Um, little did we know that COVID-19 would come along at this rate and expose all the gaps in our systems. And it showed particularly that our children were left um, in a disadvantaged position because they were not protected, they had no protections, no legislation to speak specifically to their health. Um, in the Caribbean, we had a peculiar situation. Um, uh, we just heard some statistics from Mexico and in the Caribbean, one in three Caribbean children are obese or overweight. And we also have one of the highest statistics of childhood obesity in the world. And when you hear statistics like that, it speaks to the fact that we don't put systems in place to protect our children from predatory marketing, protect our children, and ensure they have increased physical activity, or even protect them within the school environment. And these are things that we were forced to address and forced to recognize during the COVID-19 period. Now, we had some very interesting experiences. Uh, just recently, the NCD Alliance released a um, report 
on what the interferences have been like from commercial industries. And the title I thought was very fitting. It was signaling virtue promoting harm. And that's basically what we saw throughout the pandemic. We saw fast food corporations donating fast food uh, snack boxes to children homes. We saw them donating to medical professionals. We saw them advertising directly to children. And that showed immediately the lack of a strong legislative framework to protect our children from predatory marketing. Um, there was no conversation about what happens to those children who are at home who no longer have access to the school meal provisions. Now, our government provides school meals for students within the primary school institutions, but when we went into lockdown mode, there was no real serious conversation about what happens to those students at home who are depending on those meals to eat. Um, and I believe they were left in a situation where parents now have to decide what will we provide for our children. And then when we look at the situation of what it takes to provide a healthy meal, it talks about how much does it cost to provide a healthy meal. Do parents or are parents equipped with the knowledge to prepare healthy meals? Then what happens to children who are not in a situation where their parents understand that, you know, we need to ensure that our children eat healthy, have adequate physical activities, and we make sure that we protect their right to health. So COVID-19 really, in a very real way, showed the gaps in our systems across the Caribbean, because it is said, and we do think, think that persons who are between the ages of, let's say, 5 to 18 are generally healthy. This is a misconception. Many young persons are walking around with non-communicable diseases. Many young persons are overweight and obese. And when we move away from that misconception that young people are generally healthy, we start to understand that the government and society has a duty to ensure that legislation is put in place to protect the rights of children and ensure that they have access to the highest attainable standard of health. Now, within that entire conversation, within that entire framework, we acknowledge that the persons who must drive this message, the persons who must clamor and make noise for the interventions are the young people because we are the ones most affected. affected. And something I always say, there should be nothing for the youth without the youth and there should be no legislation or any conversation about protecting the rights of children without understanding from young people themselves what is needed to ensure that we are protected. And during COVID-19, we saw that persons who are most vulnerable youth, persons living with NCDs, needed to be a part of conversations from years ago so that frameworks would have been in place today so that when effects and, and pandemics like this come around, we already have a system that protects people at the basic level. Um, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation in, in today's session because we will have a conversation, we'll speak about the fact how young people can become involved in ensuring that there is an equitable approach to the health of children and youth. Yep. Thank you so much, Pierre. Um, that is that is truly truly excellent, and it speaks very well to to some of the points covered by the other panelists uh, with your uh, special uh, context. Um, I think we'll move into the questions, and we have had some around uh, the caregivers and the role of parents. And uh, I'll just read uh, two of them out loud, and then I will give the word to Faith first, and then. If any of the other panelists want to speak, please just let me know. So the first one uh, reads this from John Sykes. Generally speaking, kids can't drive to the store and buy sugary sodas, junk food, etc. We can fight the industry, the industries who market and advertise these products, legislate, legislate policy and implement taxes, but in many cases, caregivers are providing these harmful items. I'd like to hear thoughts and ideas regarding behavioral and educational influences involving caregivers as role models for children. Thank you. And then there was another one that was slightly linked, which I think was from Faisal Ali. I think the parents are playing a cru crucial role in the developing or preventing adiposity, uh, the adiposity phenotype in children by choosing the healthiest and most nutritious foods during the ordinary meals, as well as their healthy advices in terms of healthy eating and physical activity. I'm sure there are uh, many different takes on this, but uh, I'll give the floor first to you, Faith. Thank you. So I just wanted to comment that I think that in cases of childhood and adolescent obesity, we are very quick to run and kind of um, place blame or place responsibility on parents, which I do think there is a level of responsibility, but I wanted to share some anecdotal um, evidence from my life as a patient, and then also kind of comment on some other factors um, that I've learned with my research work. But I was 33 pounds at a year old. So obesity is something that um, I've lived with for as long as I can remember. My uh, 
parents both had bariatric surgery at different points in my life. Um, but throughout middle school and elementary school, my mom would go out of her way to go to specialty grocery stores. Um, they're a little bit more commonplace now, things like whole foods with the whole natural foods. And she would sit in aisles and look at the ingredients and make sure that she was giving me um, less processed options and going out of her way consistently um, to ensure that she was giving me what I needed. Despite her efforts at 14 years old, when I started my um, bariatric obesity journey, I was 273 pounds. So the effort was there, the desire was there. And I also think that um, marketing can go both ways. So marketing for bad foods, but there's also foods that are marketed as healthy and organic that parents are purchasing, thinking that they're making good decisions um, when there's not a lot of transparency there. So I think parents have good intentions. I'm not saying that um, there might not be cases where there's bad foods coming into the house that maybe shouldn't be coming into the house. But um, I want to give parents the benefit of the doubt and say that they're trying and they really do care about their children's health, but marketing can go both ways. And then on the other hand, there's also factors that are completely outside of their control, um, such as socioeconomic status and the cost and access to healthy, fresh foods, um, as well as the existence of green spaces and safe places to play in neighborhoods. Um, so I think that a lot of policy and legislation can go towards um, kind of shifting that relationship so that there's all these healthy options that are easily available. Right now, we just live in a society where the healthiest decision is not the easiest decision. Um, and I think that that needs to change. Thank you so much, Faith. Uh, Pierre? Uh, yes, no, Faith brought it across beautifully. And I just want to supplement that. I think um, when I look at children and understand the issues that affect children, I like to say that it's never the child's fault. A child is the product of his or her environment. And when we look at the situations where children are growing up in, whether it's in the Caribbean, in the UK, or even anywhere across the world, children are the sum total of the environment they live in. And that speaks to responsibility of not only parents, but to the entire society. So government have a responsibility to ensure that within uh, that, that, that framework, at schools, at home, to as much as they can control it, children have access to the highest attainable standard of health. So for example, if the government can put systems in place to ensure that parents who uh, may not have it as much to buy healthier foods, um, put provisions in place to ensure that they have access to funds or even access to food that are healthier. Um, if governments can ensure that they're um, parent training programs so parents understand how to prepare healthier meals. Um, Faith, I, I don't know your, your situation personally, but I guess your parents had to learn probably um, on the flight how to cater specifically to your type of needs because there was no formal system in place to ensure that parents are educated about how to prepare healthy meals for their children, how to understand childhood obesity, how it works, how to prevent this from happening with children. Because the, the, the approach that we need to take is not that we're placing blame on a single person, and mind you, the blame is never on the child. The child is never responsible for his situation or her situation because the child is a product of his or her environment. It's a responsibility in government to ensure that there's a supportive framework in place so that parents can then fall into that system and ensure that they put systems in place to protect their children. So yes, we do agree that parents are the ones buying the food, um, when you take the child over by the grandparents for the weekend, they're the one buying the sweets. But it also says that in our training or in our, in our education, Education, we need to make sure that our training targets parents as well. So in the Caribbean, we're ensuring that when we talk about childhood obesity, we bring the parents in and we have conversations with them and show them this is the effect of your habits and your shopping habits on your child. This is how you can mitigate that. But it also speaks to a wider approach because when you speak to parents, children are at home with their parents, but then when they're in the schools, who then is in charge of their meals? They have access to that school system. So schools also need to have a supportive environment so that children have access to healthy foods. When children then go by their grandparents, maybe the grandparents weren't a part of that discussion. We leave them again in a situation where the grandparents may then decide we're gonna provide them with certain foods that may not be the healthiest. Even in that instant, it speaks to the fact that the entire society needs to be engaged and committed to protecting the rights of children and ensuring that they don't suffer from obesity or even being overweight from a young age because we know that that leads to uh, non-communicable diseases in the future. It also speaks to front of package labeling, but I think we'll get into a bit of that later on in the conversation. Thank you so much, Pierre. And I think that that's an important point around the, the multifaceted aspects of, of this challenge. And I also, I think it answered well the, the question from a, from a GP working in the UK who would like to know how we can raise the issues of, of obesity and what I hear you're saying and what is also my own experience is really uh, as a doctor, you just have to speak 
clearly about it in a non-stigmatizing way, but you need to be able to say that the weight is 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 high and it is uh, on an unhealthy trajectory. I think that a comforting factor for for children, and I'm sure there are many on this call who are experts in it, is the fact that they can grow out of their obesity uh, with with gaining uh, height. Uh, right. So. Um, and then, and then I wanted to also just highlight the fact that we are in many countries seeing um, associations between low-income families and obesity because of the systems that we have spoken so much about. And and surely uh, there is a role for the family, but there are also uh, just the systems that put uh, low-income families at, at higher risk. Um, I know that Tasha, you also wanted to get the word. Yeah, just to be a quick on on top of what um, Faith and Perry uh, have said, I think the reason why I was saying in the comment section, the reason why I joined Back Back is because I really wanted to change the narrative in terms of how we talk about um, obesity. A lot of the time it's always, if it's children, it's the parent's fault. And if it's an adult, it's your fault. Like you're in charge of what you put in your mouth. And I do, you know, recognize there's a level of accountability for those particular people involved. But I also cannot stress um, how important it is for us to recognize that the food environment in which we live in has dramatically changed. When we look at, you know, the obesity rates in the 80s and the 90s, they were significantly lower. And that was because the environment that people were growing up with, they had, you know, open space. It was really easy for you to get food that is nutritious and healthy. It was really accessible. And then compare that to now, that is no longer the case. A lot of, you know, youth centers where young people can, you know, join and can talk, can, you know, socialize, they've all been closed. Open space is no longer that accessible. But also when we start looking at the systems and structures that we have within society, we now have this, you know, uh, this wealth gap that makes it a lot harder for disadvantaged families and communities to access this food that is healthier. We also look at the role that supermarkets have played. You know, we know that price promotions are significantly more likely to be placed on foods that are high in fat, salt and sugar. When we look at your high street, I know growing up my high street had like five six fast food shops all of them serving the exact same thing at like a ridiculously low price when we look at schools and we also forget that as kids grow up you spend a lot of time in school so there's a role for schools to, that's a role for schools to play in educating the importance of nutrition for me everything that I know about back back is me genuinely having a passion in it um everything that i know about uh, obesity is me going onto the internet googling speaking to people i didn't have that same opportunity when i was in school we didn't really talk about nutrition we didn't talk about healthy eating the implications of that so it's definitely a multifaceted um problem you know when we're looking at you know food deserts in the uk we have food desert food deserts and I find that so absurd such a wealthy country there's still people who don't have a supermarket that you know that is close by their nearest supermarket is about an hour away no wonder they go to their corner shop for their shopping and then you find that prices especially for the health options are ridiculously high so again it's about recognizing that the food environment that we're growing up in is so much different is so different and it doesn't encourage healthy living and healthy lifestyle it doesn't make that decision that you know we're supposed to have even for children when we're looking at advertising you know um, advertising companies they spend millions of pounds on advertising because they know it works they don't spend it for the sake of spending it you know so when they're oh, when they're strategically targeting children on social media on tv advertisement or using their favorite characters on their yogurt pot uh, or you know their favorite pack of crisps all of that adds to that pressure almost to uh, to go towards these unhealthier foods and stay away from the healthier options that are available Thanks, Tasha. I, I, I think your your experiences from the UK as a high income country and speaking about food deserts are very moving and, and really put sort of a, a nails down the point here. Um, I'll give the word to Leslie and then afterwards we'll speak about a bit about meaningful youth participation. There have been some questions around uh, how we can how we have best been uh, participating as youth representatives and also how young people can take part in in obesity. Um, uh, policy making, but Leslie, please first. Thank you. I, I agree totally that the problem is the food environment. We have to focus on that and stop blaming or stigmatizing people living with obesity or parents that had uh, kids with obesity or overweight. This is very, very important. And I think it's uh, part of the narrative of the industry to blame the parents or to blame or to put the responsibility in the person instead of in the state. The state has to play an important role with strong regulation. 
And this strong regulation not only protect children or adolescents, it also make be aware to the adults that are going to be the ones that buy the food. For instance, a good front of pack food labeling can give like true and very easy and real information about the food that they are buying. Like in Mexico, we had that example. We used to have a GDA and a front of pack food labeling that was very deceitful on purpose. So no one could understand what they were buying. No one, like not even nutritionists. There one, there's one study with nutritionists and only 12.5% of, the, of them could uh, really know what the product has. And to do it, they spend in uh, on average 3.3 minutes. When, when we go to the supermarket and when we want to shop food, we only spend around 15 to 20 seconds to make a decision what type of food. And of course, parents, they don't want to provide harmful food to their kids. Is that the, they, they, they are part of these um, very aggressive advertising of unhealthy food that is targeting especially children. And of course they might think, yes, this is for children when it's not, it's not healthy. And on the other hand, I think we, we have to talk about breastfeeding and especially in countries like man where the, the breast milk substitutes industry has a lot of interference and they don't comply the, the international code at all. So we can see in TV or in print, in media, in social media even, some of the commercials about the benefits of formula when we know that the best option is breastfeeding. So this is very, very aggressive and unethical marketing to say that some, some to create a necessity in a place where you don't need it at all. So I think we all, and it, this is not just a problem of women, like we all have to be part of this to promote, protect breastfeeding. And it's important that, as you mentioned, like young people must be on the table and on the decision-making. In the case of breastfeeding, it's ridiculous that men are the ones that are taking the decisions about this, of the regulations, for, for example. Thank you, Leslie, and I think that that's really important. We haven't covered much about breastfeeding or, or infant formula, so uh, certainly a very important aspect to, to childhood obesity and contributor uh, in the very early stages of life. Uh, we'll now move on to, to recommendations for meaningful youth participation, both in policymaking and in, um, in meetings. Uh, and I'm glad to see that we've had some questions around this because I think it speaks to, to how great you guys uh, in the panel have been. So we'll take a brief comment from Pierre and a, maybe one more of the panelists and then we have to wrap up. Okay, thank you very much for this question, Marie. This is something I've been passionate about for a very, 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 very long time, um, specifically because I've been in spaces where youth have been engaged or invited just to tick a box um, as an act of tokenism and we feel very underappreciated. Um, I'll tell you what my experience has been like with youth engagement, meaningful youth engagement. And I think it's a model that others can um, exemplify. So in the Caribbean with the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, um, I attended a meeting. They were very keen on having me to be a part of their process. What they did was very unique. They offered opportunities for capacity building. So for me to understand what the systems of um, non-communicable diseases are, how it works, um, what are the organizations involved and engage, and help me to understand the message better. They knew I had a passion, but they helped me to facilitate and hone in specifically on how I could use that passion to uh, advocate for the rights of young people. Secondly, providing very real opportunities for young people to engage with stakeholders, not only at the local level, but at the regional international level. I've been able to speak to um, ministers locally, I've been able to speak internationally, and it's all because I've had the capacity building and also been provided with the opportunities to speak out and speak up. Um, understanding that young people should be speaking about issues that affect them, understanding that young people should be a part of all conversations affecting them is the first step to making sure that you have meaningful youth engagement within your systems. When you understand that the decisions you make today are not for a future you will inherit, it's for a future that young people will, will inherit 
you understand that they need to be and we need to be a part of the process. So ensuring that you have that capacity building, providing very real opportunities for meaningful youth engagement. So you ensure that young people are engaged from the ideation, the building, the implementation, the execution, and ensuring that there's some level of accountability ensures that throughout the process, young people have been engaged in a very meaningful way and it's not an act of tokenism. Then we feel appreciated and then we're willing to help you even despite our busy schedules, yeah. Thank you, Pierre, and, and certainly the, the tokenism is an important aspect to this and, and that, that is the contrary to that is, is truly meaningful. And Faith, brief comment? Yeah, and so I also wanted to build on that and to just note the importance of how you approach such a sensitive topic and to be mindful that in terms of um, social media, everywhere they turn, they're kind of being told this is your fault, um, if you wanted it more badly, you could be losing weight, um, that their bodies are not the ideal. So I think that in terms of approaching youth, you should be very considerate of the language that you're using and, you know, check any assumptions that you might be making. Because um, I can say in my experience as a youth advocate, I've spoken to the Associated Press about my experience. And anytime I've been outspoken, there's always responses from people that are very negative. And if I wasn't more um, thick skinned than I am, then that would have made me retreat. And I wouldn't wanna be involved in these conversations anymore. And we need youth voices to be involved. Um, so I think we need to be really cognizant of how we're speaking to youth about these very sensitive topics. Thank you so much, Faith. And, and thank you everyone, uh, also Louise and, um, and Claudia for the, the introductions in the beginning. I think we've had a really good discussion here and I'm always impressed with how much we can cover in, in such short time. Um, what, what is very clear to me um, is really how affected young people and children have been uh, during uh, the time of this pandemic. And I think we've touched on, on some very interesting um, points around the industry um, but also the life uh, living with obesity and and how that is and living in a food desert uh, whether you're in a low middle or or a high income country um, and and that that uh, inequity uh, when it comes to to childhood obesity and that those have really been uh, significantly and truly exposed during this pandemic and, and that somewhat being a silver lining to all of us going through uh, and dealing with COVID now that, that we can really highlight um, this and, and call for political action with, with um, great legitimacy. Um, so before we end, I know that Claudia wants to wrap up and I just wanna say thank you so much for everyone who's attended and Claudia will get the last word. Thank you everyone for your participation today. Um, I think we could have gone a lot longer with the webinar and before we close, I'd like to just share some insights into WAF's direct, direct involvement with youth and to have, elaborate on some ways of getting involved further. I'm really delighted to be able to say that you, young people have actually been really been placed front and center of what we've, what we've done this year. Um, just this week, we've convened a round table on childhood obesity that had youth advocates I'll actively participate in the discussions, including, um, and we launched and also that last year, we launched an online capacity building platform called Healthy Voices, which really aims to um, sustain positive youth engage and public engagement and provide a space for young people to learn, discuss and become agents of change. This was developed as part of Stop and Co-Create, two of our projects that we um, are actively participating in at World Obesity. Stay tuned for our youth-led podcast series that will be um, released this um, with a trailer this World Children's Day on the 12th, 20th of November, as you'll actually have an opportunity to hear a lot more from colleagues on the line, including Faith, um, Pierre and Tasha as well. So I'm really delighted for this opportunity. Last but um, not foremost, so in November, we are going to be hosting the last webinar of the COVID-19 series that will serve as a wrap up to really tie together some of these dis discussions that we've had over the past months. And all previous recordings are available on our website, including the recording on childhood obesity um, from the last webinar in April, focusing on the clinical implications that I alluded to earlier. I'd also like to applaud NCD Child and your work on the COVID-19 
um, campaign on Twitter in response to the pandemic. But last but not for least, I'm really excited today to also be launching our um, collaboration with Healthy Caribbean Coalition to really to create a how to e like an how to advocacy e manual for youth, young people themselves. So to all young people listening, we want to hear from you and we really want um, to create a resource that will actually help youth na navigate in the space. And in doing so, we have generated a survey that has been posted in the chat, I believe. Um, so we'd love for you to contribute and to see what you, you know, to hear from you what you would like to see in this resource. So please feel free to complete the survey. And thank you once again for, for joining us today.